Wow, look at this beautiful hydrogen atom in the ground state. There's one proton, one electron, and the electron is as close as it can be to the proton until quantum fuzziness kicks in and the electron's kind of in this wave function of positions and you don't know exactly where it is, but it's something like this. Let's shoot a photon at this and see what happens. Ho ho ho, look at this, it's a 2 0, zero state. Very nice. So now the electron is a bit farther out, a bit less bound to the proton, in a higher energy state relative to the ground state. But be careful, this is only metastable. It's going to pop back down soon, so any minute now it's going to pop into the ground state. Oh ho, there it goes. And look, we got our photon back. Did you see that flash of light? Conservation of energy. Very nice. Let's put another photon into it and see what happens. Hey, that's a 2 one, zero state. Nice. You know, that one has some angular momentum. Oh, there it goes. Let's take a moment to meditate on this situation. We'll begin by examining our atom in its most relaxed form. This dazzling little pattern is one of nature's most abundant, most ancient motifs. But there's a deep mystery here. Why is it that the electron doesn't just fall into the proton? If you model the electron and the proton as point particles and apply Maxwell's equations, you'll find that the electron will radiate out its energy and will end up falling into the proton in just a few nanoseconds. But there's hydrogen out in space that's like billions of years old. So clearly our math is a little bit off, because hydrogen actually doesn't decay instantly. So, what is it that stops the collapse? Have you ever tried to catch a quantum particle? Imagine you have one and you've caught it, you're pinching it, between your finger and your thumb. And you squeeze it really tight so you know just exactly where it is. You know its position with perfect precision. Oh, well by quantum mechanics, now you no longer know its momentum, and so it escapes. In quantum mechanics, you actually can't perfectly localize a single particle. You can try, but it takes a lot of energy, and the tighter you squeeze it, the more you localize it, the more energy it takes. If you think about it, a proton is pulling in the electron, the electron's this quantum particle, it wants to collapse all the way, but eventually there's a point where the quantum fuzziness makes it so that the uncertainty and momentum keeps the thing from falling all the way in. And so you see, hydrogen is not just an atom, it's also this portal between the world of experiment and the very strange and unusual world of quantum mechanics that bubbles up into our world. Wait, hold up. So the electron is a quantum particle and it's all fuzzy, but the proton is just this point-like thing? How does that make sense? Well, it's because the proton is about 1,836 times as massive as the electron. So just to put this into perspective, the difference in mass between an electron and a proton is the difference between an elephant and 1,836 elephants. So the proton is very, very massive. Because it's so much more massive, it's less fuzzy. It is still fuzzy. If you look very closely at it, it's fuzzy but it's much less fuzzy because there's this inverse relationship between distance and mass when it comes to quantum mechanics. Because the proton is so much more massive than the electron, we can do all of our analysis by assuming that the proton will be at the center of our coordinate system and that it doesn't move, it just stays put. And the electron does whatever quantum mechanical, cloudy, wavy stuff it does, okay? All right, let's talk about coordinates. Normally I like to use Cartesian coordinates, X, Y, and Z, but because of the nature of this problem, it has a spherical symmetry, and so spherical coordinates fit like a hand in a glove to this problem. So we're going to use these coordinates r, theta, and phi. One thing I have to point out, I got to be careful here. So normally I use theta as the angle around the longitude, like the azimuthal angle, and I use phi for the elevation angle. But for whatever reason, physicists working on the hydrogen atom always use the other way of defining theta and phi. And so I'm going to go along with that convention, but just be aware this is a little bit different than the convention that I normally use. So just to be really clear, theta is actually going to be our elevation angle, 
So that's going to be the angle that starts off at zero on the North Pole and then goes down to pi or 180 degrees at the South Pole. And then phi is going to be our azimuthal angle. So that's the angle that's going to go around the equator, zero at the prime meridian, and then, you know, it goes around a full 360 or full 2 pi. Okay, so now that we've defined our coordinate system, let's define some of the most important things in quantum mechanics. The first thing is the wave function. So the wave function is this complex valued function that's a function of both space and time. So the wave function is given the symbol psi, and psi depends in this case on r, theta, phi, and time. Closely related to the wave function is the probability density. That is the thing that if you integrate over some volume, you get the probability that the particle is going to be in that volume. The probability density is just the amplitude squared of the wave function. When you take the amplitude squared of a complex number, you get a real number. So the probability density is a real valued function, and it's also a function of space and time. Although, as we'll see when we solve energy eigenstates, it's just a function of space. Alright, and finally, the reduced Planck's constant, this number h bar, you see this everywhere in quantum mechanics. It's absolutely ubiquitous. It's a measurable quantity. It has about the value of 1.05457 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. This is a very mysterious number. It is what it is, and no one knows why it is. It just is. And so you'll see this in many of our equations today. It defines the relationship between energy and frequency and momentum and space and all kinds of stuff. Uh, it's sort of the quantum scale of uh, angular momentum or action. And by the way, I should mention, you know why they call it h bar? It's actually Planck's constant h divided by 2 pi. But so often you divide by 2 pi that people got tired of writing divided by 2 pi. So then they just put a bar on the h and now everyone knows that means divide by 2 pi. So, we want to figure out what is our electron up to? What does it do? And in order to do that, we need an equation that lets us relate things like momentum and space and time. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use the Schrodinger equation, shown here. The Schrodinger equation is just the idea that if the Hamiltonian operator acts on a wave function, that's the same thing as the energy operator acting on a wave function. Now, there's a lot of confusion when people first see Hamiltonian operator, they're not sure what that is because it's just a thing named after some guy, so who knows what it is. Well, what it is, is the energy written in terms of position and momentum, and we'll see in a moment exactly how to construct the Hamiltonian for the hydrogen atom. The energy operator is, in quantum mechanics, it's defined as I h bar times partial psi partial t. So in other words, you take the partial derivative of the wave function in time, and you rotate it 90 degrees in the complex plane by multiplying by I, and then you multiply it by that quantum scale parameter h bar. Now, if you look at this, you might be wondering, why is this the energy operator? Where does this come from? And the answer is, today, we're just going to take this as one of our principles, as one of our assumptions that we're going to use to build up this theory. If you're interested more in the nature of the energy operator, I'd recommend the book Quantum Mechanics and Path Integrals by Feynman and Hibbs. This book constructs quantum mechanics from a pretty intuitive starting point, well, relatively for quantum mechanics. And, uh, and then they show that you can basically derive all of this Schrodinger wave equations from path integrals. Now the problem with path integrals is they're impossible to work with, but they're, they're very nice to imagine. So if you want to learn more about why the energy operator is what it is, check out that book. But today we're just going to take the energy operator for granted and we're going to continue forward. Now when we solve the Schrodinger equation, we're not just interested in every possible wave function as a function of space and function of time. We're actually particularly interested in these things called energy eigenstates. They're also known as stationary states. I like to think of them as resonant modes, although that's maybe kind of an analogy, but I think it's a good one. So an energy eigenstate is a wave function that doesn't move, except it just rotates in the complex plane. So in other words, you can break it up. So the wave function as a function of space and time can be thought of as the wave function as a function of space times this time parameter, which just swings around in the complex plane, and the frequency of how much it swings around has to do with the energy of the wave function. So when we solve for the time-independent Schrodinger equation, what that means is we want to figure out what are all the patterns, or what are all the different uh, wave functions as a function of space, and then what are the corresponding energy levels? By the way, the energy levels are also called energy eigenvalues. What's the deal with all this eigen stuff anyway? Well, if you've studied linear algebra, then you'll be familiar with eigenvector and eigenvalue problems. Normally you'll have some kind of linear transformation, and then there are specific vectors that are just uniformly scaled by that transformation, and the amount to which they're scaled is the eigenvalue, and the vectors themselves are eigenvectors. And eigen, I think it comes from some German word meaning own or self, or like related to the thing. It's, it's confusing terminology, admittedly. 
But let's just apply the energy operator to an energy eigenstate and see how we can draw that parallel between eigenvector eigenvalue problems and this whole thing about eigenstates. If we apply our energy operator to psi, so we do i h bar partial psi partial t, and we substitute in our wave function, which is our energy eigenstate, where we have a spatial part and a time part, and then we work out the derivatives, what we find is that the energy operator basically amounts to just scaling the wave function by a constant everywhere in space. And so you'll notice that this seemingly simple looking equation e hat psi equals e psi, it's actually pretty profound. And this should look a lot like your classic, uh, you know, matrix times eigenvector equals eigenvalue times eigenvector equation from linear algebra. And by the way, that's not a coincidence. If you've studied structural engineering and you've calculated resonant modes and frequencies, you'll see there's really a one-to-one -one parallel between that situation and what's going on here today. Okay, so just to recap, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, that is the general, the real, for real Schrodinger equation, is the equation that the Hamiltonian operator acting on a wave function is the same as the energy operator acting on a wave function, and that lets us relate momentum and space and time, and, and we can derive the governing equations of our wave function. If we restrict our attention to solving for these energy eigenstates, which you can imagine as resonant modes, or the ways in which the equation rings, then we end up with the time-independent Schrodinger equation in which the energy operator is replaced by a constant. That constant, of course, depends on the particular energy eigenstate we're looking at. Some of them will have higher energies, some of them will have lower energies. But in any case, we can regard that energy level as an eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian operator acting on our wave function. Let's construct the Hamiltonian for the hydrogen atom. To do that, we need to add the electron's kinetic and potential energy. First, let's start with the kinetic energy. From classical non-relativistic physics, we know that the kinetic energy T is equal to 1 half mv squared, where m is the mass of the particle and v is the velocity. We also know from classical physics that momentum P is mass times velocity. Therefore, if you just rearrange those equations, you can prove to yourself that the kinetic energy is the momentum squared divided by twice the mass. And in quantum mechanics, we're going to use that exact same idea, except we're going to make the momentum a quantum thing. How do we do that? Well, we use the quantum mechanical momentum operator. So the momentum operator p hat, acting on the wave function psi, is negative i h bar times the gradient of psi. Now if we use our formula from classical physics that the kinetic energy is momentum squared divided by twice the mass, then we can derive the quantum mechanical kinetic energy operator by applying the momentum operator twice and dividing by twice the mass. When we do that, we find that the kinetic energy operator t hat applied to a wave function psi gives you negative h bar squared over 2m times the Laplacian of psi. And what that means intuitively is that if you're going to take the kinetic energy of a wave function, you look at its Laplacian. The Laplacian is basically the concavity in three dimensions. It's like a second derivative, but adding up along all the different, you know, second derivative in x plus second derivative in y plus second derivative in z. And then you multiply that concavity by h bar squared over 2m. And then you take the minus sign of that. So, you know, earlier we were talking about how it takes energy to localize a particle. The more you squeeze it, the more it sort of pushes back. Well, we can mathematically encode that in this equation with the kinetic energy operator, right? Because you, you think about it, the more you pinch a particle, the more you're increasing its Laplacian. You know, the Laplacian in a way is sort of the extent to which the wave function is pinched, right? It's the divergence of the gradient. So the more you pinch it, the more this t hat term increases. Now, if we look at the potential energy from the electron and proton Coulomb potential, so in other words, just the regular old static electricity Coulomb's law, we can see that the potential energy operator V acting on our wave function psi is just the classic minus elementary charge squared over 4 pi times the permittivity of free space times the radial coordinates all acting on our wave function psi. And so what that means is that there's going to be a potential energy term in our equation that drops off as 1 over R. But notice there's a minus sign on this potential energy, and so actually a bigger magnitude means it's more negative. Negative energy in this context just means that it's less than zero, so if the electron and proton are infinitely far away, let's call that zero, then the Coulomb potential is negative because it represents a kind of energy debt. You'd have to put energy into the hydrogen atom in order to get the electron out. And so actually this 1 over r scaling of the electrostatic potential is going to tend to pull the electron in to the proton. And so when we add the kinetic and potential energy terms together in our Hamiltonian, 
what we're describing when we do that is that balance of energies we were talking about earlier between the electron getting pulled into the proton, but also that quantum mechanical fuzziness, that kinetic energy, keeping the electron from falling all the way in. And so we can finally write our Hamiltonian operator h hat acting on psi as negative h bar squared divided by twice the mass times the Laplacian of our wave function minus the fundamental charge squared divided by 4 pi permittivity of free space r <laughs> times psi. Okay, maybe it looks like a lot if this is the first time you've seen it, but all that is to say the energy of the electron has a kinetic term and it has an electrostatic potential term. Now something I should mention here is that we want to actually use something called the reduced mass of the electron. So this is basically the same thing as the electron mass, it's like a little tiny bit less, like a part in a thousand less kind of thing. And what that does is it lets us account a little bit for the fact that the proton actually has finite mass, it's not infinitely massive. This idea comes from orbital mechanics, I believe is where this first comes from. But for our purposes today, basically, the main advantage is it lets us replace the letter m with the letter mu, because we're going to need m later on when we get to the magnetic quantum number. All right, well now that we have our Hamiltonian, we can plug it into the time-independent Schrodinger equation. That is, h hat psi equals e psi, where e is the energy eigenvalue and psi is an energy eigenstate. Let's massage this equation a little bit. We'll move the e psi term on over to the left side of the equation, we'll cancel out some minus signs, and we get this pretty looking equation that the Laplacian of psi plus 2 mu over h bar squared times e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r plus e times psi equals zero. So up until this point, we've used physics and this idea of energy operators and Schrodinger equation and Hamiltonian, so we've compiled this equation. But now solving this equation is an exercise in math. Because we can just look at it as a three-dimensional partial differential equation and ask what are the functions psi that satisfy this equation? So to that end, the first thing that we should do is write out the Laplacian in terms of partial derivatives of psi with respect to r, theta, and phi. Now here's the thing. Uh, oof. So earlier I mentioned that using spherical coordinates was going to help us out because of the spherical nature of the problem. And that is true. Spherical coordinates are very nice, trust me, we do want to use them. But there's one way in which they're not so nice. And that is, when you write out the Laplacian, it's quite an expression. Anyway, I'm not going to go into the whole derivation of this now, but if you just look up Laplacian written in spherical coordinates, you'll see this expression. It's a bit complicated, but it is what it is, you know? No matter how fun it is, it is what it is. <laughs> okay, now all we have to do is take our expression for the Laplacian and put it into that equation, and what we end up with is a three-dimensional partial differential equation for psi as a function of the variables r, theta, and phi. Wow, look at this thing. Ugh, oh, what a mess. <laughs> but there it is. This is a beautiful equation, in a way. So let's solve it. Let's solve it for psi. <laughs> How hard can it be?